Hey there, garden nerds. I have a big announcement before we get to today's episode. Over the holidays, we developed and recorded a brand new online course that I'm really excited about. It will help you get ready for spring planting with ease. I created this course to share the step-by-step -step process that I use every day with all of my students and clients for planning your seasonal garden layout on paper before you ever plant a single seed. You can find out more about this exciting new online course at gardennerd.com. Just search planning list to find where you can get on the waiting list and you'll get a free PDF guide that will help you get the most from your small space garden this season. Then you'll be the first to get the details about when the course comes out, when we're ready to launch it. Go search planning list on gardennerd.com. Now on with the show. Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where experts from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. This podcast was recorded in September of 2023. We're continuing our series of interviews with speakers from the Heirloom Expo in Ventura County, California. Today, we're talking with John Jackson. John created Comfort Farms back in 2016. It was the first project of his nonprofit organization, Stag Vets, which started in 2014. As an army veteran himself, John wanted to create a safe haven that helps vets get back on their feet and reintegrate into family, society, and economy. Today, Comfort Farms uses agrocognitive behavioral therapy to heal while teaching valuable skills in farming, economic profitability, and environmental stewardship. I'm so glad that we have this time to talk together about your work that you're doing, John. Welcome to the podcast. Well, thank you for having me. Awesome. I'm excited because you're across the country, and so we're actually in person <laughs> here. That yes. makes me very excited. Now, the first time I came across you and your work at Comfort Farms was in an article in Baker Creek's whole seed catalog, that yes. giant seed right. catalog that everybody loves to get their hands on. You Were you at the time growing seeds for Baker Creek? Is that right? Yeah. So, um, man, my, my, <laughs> my story with Baker Creek has been uh, crazy. Um, but yeah, I got into, I, I was actually called in as a speaker at the last minute because of this guy. I think it was Bundy, Ted Bundy from the BLM. Yeah, Ranch. that yep, was yep. a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. Jeer called me. He's Jeer's been following me uh, for a while, and I didn't know it because I was a big fan of Baker Creek when I was just in the military. I would grow all the seeds. And when I got out, I was doing a lot of seed work, you know, growing heirlooms and everything. And Jeer was following me, and he, I just get this phone call from Facebook. It's just like, hey, John, what's up? This is Jeer from Baker Creek. I was like, Baker Creek, what? And he's like, yeah. He goes, uh. I need you to come and speak, <laughs> you know, I'm like, whoa. And so that's kind of how our relationship really built. And uh -huh. I, I came in on last minute to speak in place of the, uh, the Bundy situation. And it's been part of my family ever since. And so uh, I, I work on a lot of uh, seeds of the African diaspora, uh, a lot of heirloom seeds. Um, we sell primarily heirloom seeds on our farm at Comfort Farms to the, to the market, things that you can't find in, the, um, in a supermarket. So we, we are very niche marketers. I want to talk more about this, the because uh, your talk at the Heirloom Expo was about seeds of the African diaspora. So let's yes. let's dive into that for a minute, and then we'll get to Comfort Farms. Yeah, you know, yes, that's, yes. this is far more interesting to me. <laughs> although your work is very interesting <laughs> to me, but so so I I remember there was a series on I think Netflix like High on the Hog, and yeah. it was really all about yeah. how many foods we eat here in the United States that come from an African. Uh, background yeah. or culture or yeah. seeds that were woven into the hair yes. of women who were brought across on slave ships. Yes. yes. All of that. So what are you, what did your talk consist of in a nutshell? In a nutshell. Yeah. So my talk consisted of really trying to bring reverence to my African ancestors. Yeah. Um, they, we have to talk like I, I, I try not to even use the word slave because slavery, uh, it almost kind of, it's, there's this intention that, or, or there's this thing that um, kind of, well, you deserved it oh. versus, versus captured Africans. Because when, you, when we talk about, when we change our language, yeah. right, and we talk about captive Africans, it's like, well, they shouldn't have been here. Well, you're right, they shouldn't have been here. And so they were captured against their will, they were brought over here, and were given no credit, right? Reparations right. Were, were never paid to, right. uh, to them for the work that they did. And 
when I grew up as a young child, I had no, um, I had no, uh, I'm sorry, um, th there was nothing to be proud about as a young black kid growing up in, a, in, a, in America with an African mother. So my talk basically was to really bring reverence to my African ancestors and the contributions that they were exploited for mm -hmm. here. And the only thing that can tell us about pre-colonialism is through seeds. That's because right. the seeds of Africans predate colonialism. They predate Jesus Christ by five, 7,000, 8,000 years. And they go back to a time when those kingdoms existed that we didn't know about, where rulers of Africa were just extremely important. And that's what I kind of brought to the table today. It was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. that is interesting. I, I love that kind of conversation. And I think, you know, one of the things I'm thinking of is how the terminology has shifted and I know we're getting kind of off topic. As we should. <laughs> but so going to Monticello, to Thomas Jefferson's yeah. garden, right? There's a whole uh, guided tour and the language, I think they were very specific to say enslaved people instead of slaves. Yes. And that yeah. was a really important shift right. that I had seen for the first time. I hadn't experienced that shift. Absolutely. And so now you're using the term captured. Yeah, captive. Captive. captive Africans, and that is even further, I think, because yes. it shows the, it, it is more, I don't know, and it, anyway, I just, uh, well, thank you for using it, that language. When, when, when we talk about language, and especially where we are today, there there's so many, we, we dilute what actually happened in slavery. Yeah. It, nobody here had a choice in who they were, it, how they right. came about, you, you know? Um, but at the end of the day, we do know that people were captured from Africa, brought over as slaves um, and then exploited for their knowledge, for their for their efficiencies to help yeah. the South in America grow, right? right. And that, that, that was really important. And so um, I, I try to use language that uh, that helps people understand like what actually took place, you know, yeah. in that space. The, the seeds in particular, do you have some examples? Yeah, so um, I introduced Motherland Okra in 2019 that Baker Creek, uh, me and Jir got together and he, we use it as a fundraiser to help comfort farms, right? So Motherland Okra is a type of okra that grows in the interior of Liberia and it's on another level. Um, some people refer to it as the wolf of all okra. Um, they call it the mother of all okra. Um, but it's it's on another level of okra. Um, instead of um, the the one word, the one Latin word, this one is a cali. So if you look at that, the first prefix and then the last one is called cali, a cali. But this particular okra was used for mothers, like women, if they needed to have abortions, oh. they would insert the okra inside them I and see. it would induce abortions. Uh, then they would use it to induce labor. Uh -huh. So they would eat uh, what they called gumbo. Um, it's called okra soup. That's the West African name for it. And that would also help to induce um, to induce the labor, labor of the child. And then they were given that after they delivered, uh, they were given that gumbo for uh, to stop the bleeding of them. And so because it's from my mother's land, it was used for mothers, I decided that we're gonna call it motherland okra. It's a good and, name. Uh, yeah, it is a beautiful name actually. Um, it has a lot of cultural significance. And so with that, I attach those stories to our African seeds, to people of the African diaspora like myself, to be able to connect to and find some point in place in history that says, this is what my people did. And that's so important for just African Americans of the diaspora. Yeah, and having a record. Having a record, because we don't have any records. There are no records. My last name is Jackson, and that is only due to slavery. Right. And I can't go back to, you know, who my people were, but uh, through genetic, the DNA, the ancestries, been able to find out that I'm of 13 unique cultures. Um, wow. And 80% um, of those are of all of African uh, varieties from West Africa and South Africa, uh, Bantu speaking people, Central. And then the other 20%, believe it or not, is largely Viking and are the you Baltics. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird, man, right? So it's like, here I've like, you know, I, I can't even explain, well, you know, how that works. You know, my husband is really into uh, the history of language and how it traveled through. And a lot of it came from Viking conquering. The Vikings conquered everyone way yeah. before the Romans. Yeah, 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 and yeah, so yeah, that yeah. ended up being, I think that's where that ended up. Right. Happening. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. 
Uh, wow. Well, this is a lovely <laughs> tangent. I'm enjoying this. Yes. Uh, so take us back to the beginning of Comfort Farms. Yeah. Did you have farming experience before you started this project? No, I had, uh, going back to the beginning of Comfort Farms, you know, I was United States Army Ranger, um, Airborne Ranger, and I served with the 75th Ranger Regiment. Um, did my time, six combat tours, and I wanted to, I always grew in my backyard, um, big fan of Baker Creek. I was doing seeds back there. Mm -hmm. And as I was getting out due to injuries of war, I was like, hey man, you're, you're gonna get, you know, I got a pension for life. So it's like, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And um, I decided that I was gonna get in the farming. I, I love growing food. I didn't know anything about it, but I needed something that I could fail at every day because <laughs> like I come out, yeah, fail seriously. Every day. Yeah, I, I, cause I, so if true. I win at something, it's like, it gets boring. Right. And so I'm, I, I picked, a profession and something that I can stick with that would be really, really hard. And it keeps me engaged because this work isn't cut out for everybody. No, you know, it's not. not, it's like I, you fail more times than you win. And I look at those as like points in my life for me to kind of just say, okay, mother nature, you teach me a lesson, humility. I know I can't be two. <laughs> I just want to get one win. And when I get that, I hold on to it. You yeah. Know, so one of the thing I tell my students and clients often is that nature always wins. Yes. Uh, nature always wins. That's it. The house, the house always wins. House always wins. <laughs> right. So we're just, it's all about coming back to that place where we realize that we are supposed to be in concert with nature, not working against her. Yes. And I guess that might be hard for someone who's been in combat. It is hard because we are like, and this is why, this is where um, agrocognitive behavioral therapy actually comes into play, um, which is not a necessarily a real thing as, as much as a concept or ideology, right? So it's kind of like, you know, as a, as a, as a, as a war fighter, we like to calculate the risk. You know, we say, hey, this is too risky. We're not going to do it. How could we overset that? So our risk assessments are pretty set up for us to have the advantage yeah right and so we go in that's why we're good at what we do because we win most of the time uh dealing with mother nature and coming out here you're not winning at anything mm -hmm. that mindset that you can't beat it has to you have to change your whole way of thinking right because um that can cause depression if you don't win it can cause a lot of things you know people make mistakes and you know you die i come from a, a place that hey if you're not if you're not tightening up your laces and doing all these type of things, you're going to cause an accident. Somebody's going to die. Going back into the civilian world, us veterans need to understand that, that people are not going to be working at the level of you. So your expectations, number oh one, my God. need to be lessened. I hadn't thought about it yes. that way, but you're absolutely right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's it. It's a hard thing for, for veterans to do because we come out and we know what we need to survive. So we act in a way where, Hey, our family needs to be tight. Our friends need to be tight. Our coworkers need to be tight. Life needs to be tight. And we want to control all these outcomes. And the reason why there's so much homelessness amongst veterans and suicide amongst veterans is because they can't control the thing and they lose control and the people around them out of control. They can't live and they're living in their head and they're missing their that. And mother nature got lessons to teach you. And that's the first one is, you can only control what you have control over, yeah. which ultimately is nothing. Is not anything. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to gardening and farming, it's certainly the case. Yes. It's not, you don't know much. Um, so then with, now you're located in Georgia, yes, right? Yep. So tell me a little bit about the farm. Describe it for our audience so they can kind of go on a tour with you. All right. So I'm in the, um, I am in the Piedmont region of Georgia, the, which is towards the, the foot literally the foot of the Appalachia, right, of Georgia. Uh, about five miles away from us is, um, or within that five miles, we live on the Kaleen settlements. So this is the fall line. The fall line fell and we have uh, a whole unique ecosystem there um, within the 38 acres that I have of, um, of, I mean, you can find seashells and you can find like shark teeth and all that kind of stuff. There, we're actually growing in California redwood in our town wow. because of the, uh, the unique uh, structure and that's where all the natives had settled from uh, from the coast uh, from Savannah going all the way out to uh, Columbus on okay. that fall line. So it's a pretty unique place. Uh, we're growing artichoke out there. We do really well. We have a small microclimate, right? Uh, I want to, you know, I instead of looking at Georgia as a as a peanut soybean 
state or tobacco like it used to be. Um, I'm looking at where we fall along those lines across the ocean and across the country and other places. And we fall right at the uh, Morocco, you know, Northern Africa, Southern Mediterranean with the hilly areas and things like that. Ironically, we have a Piedmont region in France, which was named after and also yeah. in Italy. So we kind of own those, um, the cultures that are around that and what they do to try to bring culture into our space for why it was called. And so uh, we do a very uh, diverse biodynamic farm. We have our sheep, uh, we have our pigs, which are in our forest. Uh, we raise our own chickens, create new breeds. And a lot of this stuff is all regenerative. Everything, we, we pay attention to our soils and we build microbiology in our soils to build uh, better animals and better vegetables. You sound like you know what you're talking about. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take to learn all of that? Uh, well, I, I probably on my uh, 6,000 failure of whatever it is, and you learn from your mistakes, you know? So um, I, I, I get paid now as a consultant because of my failures. Okay. If that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that is how we learn. Yeah. Nice. So uh, I wanted to ask what your favorite things are to grow. Do you have a favorite thing to grow? Yes, a lot. Number one, motherland okra. Yeah, that's great. Motherland okra, and I'm also great growing a. Um, I'm also growing an ancient African rice, Rosio glabrameria. That is the Latin name for African rice, and so the only other rice that 99.0% of the people eat is a Rosio sativa, which is your Asian rice. And so the difference between a rosio sativa and a rosio glabamere is that a rosio sativa is your paddy rice. That is your flooded plains. It has to grow up in, in, in those uh, type of conditions with water. Um, true African rice that Africans had uh, domesticated, uh, that is an upland rice. It requires no water irrigation. You grow it like corn, sorghum, millet. Um, you water it just like you do those things. And it comes out with a beautiful head of, of rice. And um, that was the rice of Africans. So in Senegal, where my people from, the Wolof people, if you heard of jellof rice, that was the rice that they grew. Uh, Orosio, Sati Orosio glabamira is so, so, so adaptable that you can also grow it in water okay. and it can grow in land. So do it any way you are, you can grow this rice. It is in, in the genetic profile of this rice, it is, you get less pest pressure um, it's drought resistant and I mean, and it's hot and the nutrient value on it is extremely, extremely high. And so, um, this is things that we didn't know about until I started going into my African history and this rice predates Jesus Christ by 5,000 years. So this rice has been saved by many, many different African cultures. They also find this rice. They just, they also find this rice in Belize, right? Because through the slave trade, yeah. and then they found a strain of this rice in Cuba not too long ago as okay. well. So does rice tell a story? Yeah. You know, they tell a story, and, it, and not only do they tell a story of the people that use them, it tells a story based on that rice on where those people came from. Migration. Where the migration yeah. came from. And it's beautiful. And, you know, it's funny because you, you make me think of, there's this genetically engineered rice that sounds exactly like what you're talking about, and I'm like, why do we need that yeah. when we have this? That's well, what, what they did on. is the erosia sativa, the, a, the, a, the Asian rice, it's so inbred, it, it's, and a lot of it is genetically modified, right? Yeah. So that rice is having problems. So what they did, they have this rice that's called Nurika. Mm -hmm. And Nurika is the new African rice campaign. And what they did was they took the genetics from Erosia glabamiria and put it in the Erosia sativa. Not that Erosia glabamiria needed the sativa, the sativa needed, needed the, the glabamiria. But they don't give credit for the African rice as a superior product to sustain. We have to stay on this one thing. And yeah. This is a new African rice. That's what it means. And again, here we, here I am looking at my culture being diluted yeah. and not giving the reverence for and the, the appropriated the and, and not absolutely. giving credit. Absolutely. Yeah. And and that's why I exist. That's why you exist. <laughs> That's why I'm I exist. so glad you're doing this work. Yes. So uh, you mentioned that you raise animals too. I see that there are a lot of pictures on Facebook yeah. of barbecues and things yes. like that. Oh happening. yeah, we love to eat vegan, so it's one of those <laughs> things. <laughs> I've been vegetarian for 30 years, and I'm finding this hilarious. So this is fine. Um, yes. So yeah, so that's a big part of the community, isn't it's a, it? It's a big part of the community um, because number one, like I, in, in you know, tongue in cheek memory here, but. 
I would totally be a vegan if I wasn't raising my own food. I haven't eaten meat. You have, in, you yeah, have this seriously. great source. Though. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that is the way it should be, I think. Well, it's and it's also it's also when you look at how energy never stops to exist, right? And it, it's always perpetual in motion, and it just moves. You know, I, it's really important for us to raise our animals in a way that is like totally in alignment with our ancestries within the within the. Um, within the rejuvenation of the land, you know? And so I don't, you know, I, we're a nonprofit, so I don't have to sell those animals. Those animals will, you know, we, we come in, I got animals that are dying of old age, right? And they go back to the land. Yeah. Or we had a tree that we called mother that we just go take them to and, and leave them there and the buzzards come and eat them and it's just the cycle of life. Uh -huh. you know? um, I only sell to restaurants that appreciate the work that we do. That's you good. Know? Um, and, 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 and that, as you can see from the work we do, to the to the restaurants that actually buy our animals, they are celebrating life at the center of the plate, just like we do in the fields of a farm, and that's important to me. I don't care how much money you got, if you don't show that reverence in the center of the plate that Thank this you. is something special. Yeah, you go pound sand, man. We'll, we'll move on. Yeah. You know, so, so back to horticultural therapy, or in your case, agrocognitive behavioral therapy. It's been proven to help people recover from trauma. Yeah. What does your program consist of? Yeah, so we have a very unorthodox approach to this thing. And it's not, my thing is I'm trying to get therapists to get out of their comfort zone, right? And to come and use the farm, yeah. right? And a lot of VA therapists don't like to do that. They want to sit home or sit in their off four walls and they want to talk to you about war stories. And that's not going to get it. If you want a vet like me to come out and talk to you, uh, we need to put some work in together. And so uh, one of the things that our program consists of we, we kind of go through what we call the covert curriculum, right? And I always use this example of in war, you might have a person that is, um, this person may be very uh, callous towards intimacy, it's callous towards emotional feelings with another human because of the things that they had to see. They're protected. Right? They're protected. They're right? shielded. Because they have to, if a buddy dies today, and you're cleaning brain and teeth off the dash field one day, but you got to go back out and fight. You can't think about that. You have to move on from those feelings. And that happens over and over and over again. So your heart and mind are callous, right? Yeah. So it's hard for me to make a human connection with a person because people are the ones that got us there in the first place. Yeah. But when you take a, a, a sow and you say, hey, vet, I need you to watch over the sow and these piglets, she's going to burp from beginning to, you know, to the end. And that vet goes in there thinking it's nothing. And they're going in there and they're, you know, watering, you know, shucking crap and feeding <laughs> and, you know, making sure that these young pigs get going. And then they might take a pig to their farm that they're starting, you know, they're raising it up. And then I come later and say, hey, man, we got to take it to the slaughterhouse to go turn the pork chops uh -huh. and you want to see a war fighter cry. Yeah. And they didn't even know that they were developing those things. Now they want to be more closely in tune with their children. They want to be more closely in tune with their wife or their loved one, you yeah. know, uh, because there's these connections that we're building bridges back to that makes total sense with animals in the farm and how we do things without them even knowing it. Yeah. And so to me, I'm a falconer. I train birds of prey. Oh, really? And yeah. So I train, <laughs> I train birds of prey. And that's when I talk to one of the therapists, when I, when I talk to one of the therapists about what I plan on doing, um, and I told her what my thoughts were, she was absolutely amazed. She thought it was a brilliant idea because I train hawks not to, the hawks already know how to hunt. Hawks already know whatever. <laughs> it's in their it, DNA. It, it's in their DNA. Yeah. But what I'm training them to do is to accept me as their partner, right? We, let's hunt together. And so there's a system that we go through with um, positive reinforcement. And when I became a, cal a falconer, the first book I had to read through my sponsor, Diane Simbello, she's an amazing, amazing uh, person. She told me to, she said, before I take you out to learn falconry, I need you to read one book. And I was like, what's that? And she said, don't shoot the dog. <laughs> don't shoot the dog was, was the book that I had to read. And so I was like, okay. But what this book talks about is the power of positive reinforcement. In the military, what we do is we use negative reinforcement. Right. Drop. Give me some push-ups. Right. Oh, you blah, 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 blah. And tearing down a person's individuality yeah, so they work as a team. Yeah, absolutely, right? Yeah. So nobody scores a touchdown if they weren't expecting the applause. It would be boring. Why right. would you go if the cloud sounds yeah. silent, right? So you score a touchdown, you get the applause, you get that rush, you get that adrenaline. So there's a lot of ways that in, in, in falconry, 
you can only use positive reinforcement. So you can't tell a bird, mad bird, or spray it with water. It's just gonna look at you like, what are you, what you doing, right? What you do with your cat. Right, right, absolutely. <laughs> birds have no, birds are the perfect animal to do this because it funnels your zone into like looking at this animal and say, hey, we're gonna, we gotta be partners here. And the bird's like, I'm waiting on you, you know? And so you go through this system of, yeah, you gotta bring the weight down and you're showing it, hey, it, it, it's, it needs to be comfortable with eating off you and things like that. And then you let it go and it's flying around doing the things it needs to do. Yeah. But that is the same concept that I've used with helping vets like myself is to use more positive association, more positive reinforcement for the life around them. Be optimistic. Guess what? We're not at war. We're not at war now. Doom and gloom is not about to happen. It's, you know, let's look at ways and challenge ourselves on how we, because we're leaders, let's look at our ways and challenge ourselves on how to build up people around us to include our family and children first, which is the biggest dynamic that we have. Yeah. And then we move outside of that. And once you're able to do that, it, it just becomes perpetual in that space. And I imagine you're dealing, well, you know, the whole thing is with veterans is PTSD and all of the trauma, other trauma related issues around that. Yes. Do you feel like, well, I think my question is, there was a time when no one talked about that. Right. And now people talk about it more. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a change in the way that people talk about it? in your in your program or is it still just like breaking through a, st a stone wall to get to people we don't necessarily talk about it yeah because we all assume that we are affected by it okay so it's like when i talk to veterans that have been to war signed up and things like that i'm not gonna ask you whether you have ptsd or not you just know i just know i just assume you're yeah. here for a reason right yeah so um and I, now, now I leave it up to that vet on how comfortable he or she is to talk to me about their things. But that's you, that usually happens after a level of trust comes in. And usually that level of trust is with us breaking sweat, you know? Exactly. Breaking sweat, working together, doing things. Now I earn your trust. Now it's like, now you get these stories. And I tell people who are non-vets who are working on our farm, I said, hey, you're going to be working with a vet. You guys are going to be off doing your thing and you're going to form relationships and guess what? You probably go fishing together or you're going to the bar, probably drink a beer together or whatever. That vet may choose you to tell a story to that. He hasn't told his wife, he hasn't told anybody, he choose you. And your job as a civilian who's never been there is to just listen, mm -hmm. is to just listen. There's a reason why that vet chose you to talk to. And so we create these relationships within our community that are, are very, um, you know, this, they're very, uh, they're, they're attached, like this attachments that are made, mm -hmm. like never end. And, and it's so beautiful to see vets who didn't have a sense of community, who felt like community was dead, be able to find community at Fort Comfort Farms where they've made lifelong friends and can rely. Because the time when you're in crisis and you need help is not at that point for the first time. Yeah. It's, it's who you made those relationships with. People who love you and care about you notice a change in you, they reach out. And you can't expect people to reach out if you've never, especially with vets, if you've never made that bond. And so that's what we give our, we give our veterans with civilian population opportunity to, to mend bonds with all the programs and festivals that we have at our farm. And the vets don't even know it. And they come in and just are like, like, influential players in that space and then the community like hey we want to support this to help the vets and the vets are like we want to support this to help the community and i just stand back you know that's so great like the magic work <laughs> that's an yeah. amazing creation yeah yeah and it's beautiful it's the the lifelong friends we have the the things that has the magic that happens on comfort farms is like it, it's nuts man and um it's 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 something i'm extremely proud about it sounds like you have a lot to be yeah. proud of. All right, so what's next for Stag Vets and Comfort Farms? Ooh, good Lord. Um, <laughs> so we have went through a couple of years through COVID on doing a lot of teaching and helping uh, veterans and non-vets on the issues of sustainable. I don't, I don't use the word sustainable, sorry. Regenerative farming. Yeah. Um, and we, we help them kind of connect in that area. Um, I'm doing a lot of seed work on preservation of, of seeds and not only the preservation of these heirloom seeds, but getting these heirloom seeds to 
um, like commercial production status. I think that's important. That is important. Yeah, because um, in doing it the right way. And so I, there's a place for commercial farmers and there's a place for small growers like myself. Small growers, we have the ability to raise food in our region and understand what works and then select those seeds to take those to the commercial market. And, and that's where the small farmer can really get, make it profitable for them. You know, Ben Cohen, ben Cohen um, he is a good friend of mine, and we talked early on, and one of the things he said that always stuck to me is that you can't have a local food program unless your seeds are local. Right. Yep. Bevan Cohen has been a guest on this yeah. podcast. Uh, everyone can go back and listen to that. We were talking to him about edible uh, pressing, edible oils, seed yeah. and nut oils. So yes. go listen to that episode. Okay. So. Yeah. So, so Bevan was uh, great as we were going through. And that was just this magic that came through where he just said, hey, yeah, you know, you can't have a local food program unless your seeds are local. And that's why it's important at the local regional level to develop seeds to develop the, the food program through local seeds. Yeah. And these are things that everybody could get a, be a part of, right? Because it can supply great income as we, as we, can, as we put, we lost so many varieties of seeds, right? Yeah. Uh, there was a thing out one time we had 500 different variety of greens back in the early 1900s and we're down to 60 now. Yeah. Right. So all those other seed varieties are gone, extinct forever. And, and now, you know, what we need to do is preserve what we have, but we also need to get into the creation of developing new varieties that we've lost. And there's hundreds of varieties that we lost. So um, that's kind of the work that I'm doing, the work that I'm, uh, I'm really interested in. It's exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, it is tip time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time for a favorite tip. Do you have a favorite tip you want to share with the Garden Nerd audience? Yes, I do. I, I do. Um, favorite tip that I have, um, so in Georgia, we have a lot of uh, pine that, uh, a planted pine that are, they, they're coming down, regardless, like the flea beetles and stuff uh, like that, they're coming down. So you have to go in and you have to clear cut your land, right? Clear cut your land, uh, get those, you gotta get those, um, you gotta get those, uh, the, those pine out of there because they're not profitable and they were planted there in, in place of native plants, right? So this is gonna work everywhere. In Africa and a lot of indigenous com countries, uh, they, they burn their fields, right? And so what we do is uh, we burn, we burn all of that wood and then we put it back into the soil. So I would go back to depleted soils and put in all that charcoal and all that and all that uh, ash back into the soil. Mm -hmm. Then I'll go ahead and I'll plant my seed, my cover crop over that, and uh, with our rainfalls, you want to talk about the most lush greenery and forage crop for your animals that you'll ever see. It's amazing because what you're doing is the the micro the micronutrients need that carbon. They want that carbon. Well, you just put the carbon right back into the soil. It, it tenfold. Yeah. And so okay. they. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna ask. Do you have clay? I'm sorry. Do you have acidic or alkaline soil where you are? Um, it's a it's a mixture of both. Okay. You know, it's um we have a we have a clay we have clay, but there's also the sandy loam. Yeah. That's really really well too. Um, and in terms of acidity. Because uh, I know for for those of us who live with alkaline soil, we've always been taught not to put wood ash into oh, our yeah, soil yeah, yeah. because it makes it more alkaline. Right. Um, so are you? I guess you're not. You're saying you you have no problem with that happening. Right? No, no. Um, in fact, it's it's one of these things that you know. There's a lot of things that we're told not to do, mm -hmm. and you look at nature and how it does it yeah and nature tells you that it this is okay this is how it was meant to be and so you're burying biochar basically yes pretty much Got it. Okay, yeah, that yeah. Makes we're, sense. we're burying biochar and um one of the things i took dr lane's uh ingram's course yes right? and so, so i um one of the beauties about what she talks about is that you know your two you have your prairie system which is all bacterial you dominant know, dominant and yes. then you have your woods which are all fungal dominant right, right. And so the prairies would do a burn, right? Mm -hmm. The prairies would do a burn. Um, in Africa, what they do with the uh, with a lot of their fields that they go to is that they burn their slash crops. So like motherland okra, once it gets, you know, all high and everything, they go ahead and they burn their fields, right? And they put it, the nutrients back, back to the soil. soil. We have been able, we've used, we don't use any, and, and this is funny because on Dr. Ingram's uh, thing, after six years of growing, I went back to my thing thinking, I need to add lime. Let me add lime. Let me do this because I need to. So I ordered a pallet of lime 
and all this other stuff thinking I have to rebuild yeah. my soil because I've been growing on it so, so much. But I've been growing in this way. And I get my readings back and it says I need nothing. All my levels are like this. Yeah. And I'm like, I just shake my head. I'm like, I just bought a whole pile of lime <laughs> that I can't even use. You have to sell that I on have to sell, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's a beautiful thing because when you work in a natural way and a natural order of things, and I follow, like I travel all over the world with these indigenous countries, and one of the things they do is they take their they take their burnable materials along with their bones and everything else like that, and they put them back into the ground. Yeah. And so um, that's what we do. That's what we practice. You know. Yeah. I've been I've been reading a woman named she's just been a guest on the podcast too, Helen Atow. She's writing all about how to uh, grow living mulches and turn them into the crop the not turn them in but like blow after mowing them blowing the crop residues onto the crops and she stopped having to use fertilizer ever oh it's a, it's a beautiful thing um so we take all of our um we take all of our cows and our pigs and things like that the bones that we get if we don't sell it for bone broth uh -huh. we go ahead and make a, a bone char out of them okay. um they found you know scientists have found where bone char um it, it produced npk you know within that uh within that bone char um, they found it up to uh, residue up to 10,000 years in the soil. Wow. And so the beauty about bone char is that the bio is that the, uh, the, the bacteria, they, they live in just kind of like this microphone. Yeah, they, they get in the they, pocket. They live in those pockets. So you're talking trillions upon trillions upon yeah. trillions of living organisms that are in that space that make your soil living. And so I try to talk in a way where you know, we grow in living soil because you can grow organically in non-living yeah, soil, right? But I love to look at all the uh, macro, like, like I say, I grow where the wild things are because like literally you go in our soil and you have worms and you have like pill bugs and you have all these things that are just moving about. And like Dr. Ingram talks about, you know, it's yeah. like, this is life, you know? And so um, we, we pride ourselves off of growing in living soils, and that's some of the practices that we use by putting our uh, char back into the soils. That's a great tip. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, John, thank for you. being on the podcast and sharing that expert tip. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. How do people find you? All right. So you can find me at Comfort Farms on both Instagram and Facebook, um, or you can go to Stag Vet's website and sign up for our newsletter. We'll keep you informed of all the great things that we got going on especially the boucherie in January. So that's, yeah, S Stag Vets Inc, S-T-A-G-V-E-T-S-I-N-C dot org. And we have this very popular food festival at our farm called the Lea Piedumont Boucherie okay. Festival. And it's the butcher at the foot of the mountain. And it's a, it's a mecca for all farmers and veterans and chefs and butchers. And we bring them together. I get vegans that come there and that's the only time they eat meat. That makes sense. I always <laughs> said if I could kill one of my own chickens, I would eat it. Yeah. But then I had I killed one of them and I I, I it wasn't right for weeks. So I figure I'm still on the vegetarian track. We teach people how to do it humanely. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, so the blade wasn't in. sharp enough. No, yo, you owe it to the animal for <laughs> sharp blades. It was wrong. It was a horrible experience. <laughs> right, never right. Do it again. All right, gardeners, <laughs> let's end on that note. Yes. You'll find a link to Stag Vet's website this week on gardener.com. We'll also link to Comfort Farm social media and where you can donate to support vets in the program. Thank That's you. it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at gardener.com. Consider becoming a Patreon subscriber to support the free stuff we do here at Garden Nerd. You'll find us on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter under Garden Nerd One, on Facebook as gardener.com, and of course, our Garden nerd youtube channel happy gardening